Welcome to the Garage Party, wherever you are and whatever you are doing. Thank you for listening and thank you for joining the party. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always, co-hosting, and he's also in charge of the coat check. And note, if you are checking your coat, all loose change will be lost. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the captain. Yeah, you'd have to be a freaking psychopath to wear a coat in this heat. It's good to be seen. It's good to see you. Thanks for joining us here at the 500th episode party. It's time to take your pants off and get wild. That's right. This is where the heroes come to play and the champions of listener land come to kick it with us at the 500 Club. Yeah, big thank you to everybody and all the support in the first 500 episodes. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> It's all because of you that this is possible. Captain, let's continue the celebration. The party goes on. Let's hear the next stop on our countdown. 5 This is True Crime Garage. And this is the Killing Fields trilogy. Interstate 45, or I-45, is a highway located entirely in the state of Texas. The interstate is just over 280 miles in length and connects two major U.S. cities, Dallas and Houston. From Houston, the highway continues southeast down to Galveston. There is a portion of I-45 that is known to Houston residents as the Gulf Freeway. A short elevated section of I-45 in southern downtown Houston is known as Pierce Elevated, and a 50-mile stretch of desolate land between Houston and Galveston is called the Highway of Hell. A mile from I-45 lies a 25-acre patch of land that borders the Calder Oil Field. This is known to all as the Texas Killing Field. It is just rugged wasteland but it is here that for decades the dead have appeared. Starting in the early 1970s and to this day, many bodies of murder victims have been found within this area and the killing field. Many girls and young women have gone missing. Several have never been found. There are some similarities in these cases. All of the victims are pretty young girls and women between the ages of 12 and 23 and most of the located victims were found in or around water. The Texas Killing Fields murders will involve three different counties, and 12 different law enforcement agencies have worked these cases, including the FBI. Despite exhaustive efforts, very few of these murders have been solved. Many officers say that the 50-mile stretch is the perfect dumping ground for serial killers, and the Killing Field has been described as a place that even if you yelled, no one would hear you, and if you ran, there wouldn't be anywhere to go. This is the perfect place for killing someone and getting away with it. The disappearances, abductions, and murders span over 30 years. Welcome to the Killing Fields Trilogy. Yeah. 500 episodes and I've realized that Ohio is one messed up place, but so is Texas. That's right. That's when we took the flying garage ship down to the great state of Texas for the Texas Killing Fields episodes. That was episode 132 from that trailer, but that's the start of the trilogy. So 132 through 134. 
I love the music there, and I love that guy that's reading. He's, <laughs> he's uh, sounds like a wonderful person. Sounds really smart. I like the percussionist. It sounds like he's playing the uh, beer bottle there, which sounds to me like it's probably a, a 22 ounce or about half full. Yeah, he's the same guy that did the the voiceovers. Right. For the numbers, number right. four. The creepy guy that's hiding over there that keeps he's staring at me with those dead black eyes. Yeah, he's hiding. Guess where he's hiding the bottles? You don't want to know. <laughs> you don't want to know. couple beer shout-outs here, Captain. Big shout-out to Cheryl in West Columbia, Texas, and a shout-out to Amy Beth in Plymouth, Michigan. Yeah, B W E W R U N beer run. That's right. If you want to help us fill up the beer fridge, you go to truecrimegarage.com. There's a little button there you can click on, and it helps the show. And you know what? We always say with the spillover, we like to call it the spillover, we like to help some of our friends out there in the true crime world. In the true crime world, that is correct. Well, we don't have any time for hesitation or masturbation, so let's get right into number this is true crime garage and this is the case of the boys on the tracks Counts, the engineer did a masterful job of bringing his train to a stop. It had taken a screaming, screeching half mile. By the time the engine had shuddered to a standstill, conductor Jerry Tomlin was on the radio notifying an approaching train on a parallel track to stop because some boys had been run over. He had also called the dispatcher. Have you got injuries? The dispatcher asked. No, Tomlin said. We've got death. I'm sure we've got death. They passed under us. It has to be death. It has to be death. And for all the True Crime Garage super fans, they know what that case is. Boys on the Tracks. The Boys on the Tracks. That's one of the cases that we receive probably the the most most praise for. Yeah, Yeah, but it's funny because people go, hey, I I listened to John Benet Ramsey. Six-part episode. Great work. Even if they don't agree with with what we uh, or our thoughts on that case. Or Brian Schaefer. I love your coverage of that. But then we'll discuss it. And I've had so many discussions about John Benet Ramsey, Brian Schaefer, the Delphi murders, so many other cases. But Boys on the Tracks, it's really just like Boys on the Tracks, that was a great job. No discussion. You're right. Doesn't seem to need any discussion. Yeah. And I think a lot of that is that people appreciate that we are trying to right a wrong with this case and we do that with with many that we present but we weren't the first ones to do it in fact we decided to cover this case for a multitude of reasons but one back in the day it was one of my favorite episodes of unsolved mysteries and the segment that profiled the boys on the tracks case at that time was known as the friends forever case because it is about the murders of kevin ives and don henry both from Bryant, Arkansas. And the piece that I'm reading from there in the Boys on the Tracks trailer, we should point out that that is episode 93. That was a four-parter, Boys on the Tracks. But the piece that I'm reading there, Captain, is from Mara Leverett's 1999 book, 
Boys on the Tracks, Death, Denial, and a Mother's Crusade to Bring Her Son's Killers to Justice. And in fact, that book went on to win some awards, and rightfully so. Mara Leverett is one of my favorite true crime authors. I find that I think she's very underrated in the world of true crime. She's written The Devil's Knot and Boys on the Tracks. She's fantastic when it comes to, there's probably nobody better when it comes to writing about true crime in the state of Arkansas. I'd like to give a beer shout out to Christopher and New Market, New Hampshire. Christopher likes anything that's new. That's why he lives yeah. in New Market, New Hampshire. How about a shout out to Rosalie in Boston Spa, New York. She likes things that are new as well. Yeah, but she, well, yeah, she prefers her York new, but everything else she prefers <laughs> old. All right, so, so should we get to number three? Let's hit them with number three. St. Michael, the Archangel, defend us in our day of battle. Protect us against the deceit and wickedness of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And you, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, banish into hell Satan and all of the evil spirits who roam through the world seeking the ruin of souls. St. Michael is one of the principal angels. His name was the war cry of the good angels, as he led them in the battle fought in heaven against those led by the dragon, who was in fact the devil or Satan. The devil and his followers were defeated, and they were thrown down to earth. According to scripture, Christian tradition gives to St. Michael four offices. To be the champion of God's people. To fight against Satan. To call away from earth and bring men's souls to judgment. And to rescue the souls of the faithful from the power of the enemy, especially at the hour of death. Tuesday, March 3rd, 1998, Monroe, Wisconsin. Two men, both priests, are driving. It's about 8.30 p.m. Father Alfred Coons, the passenger, is getting a ride home from his longtime friend and pal, Father Fiore. A dusty Wisconsin snow was falling. Fiore and Coons had a 70-mile drive ahead of them, taking them all the way to the tiny town of Dane, Wisconsin. With a population of only about 700 hardworking and God-fearing people, Dane was only a small blip on the big Wisconsin map. It was where Father Alfred Coons had called home for many years. And for many years, he has loved and taken care of the good people of Dane. It was a beautiful night, one of those clear March nights where the snowflakes melt when they touch the pavement. About halfway home, Father Coons became silent, and then he started to clam up. Fiore looked at his friend and said, Al, you have been a good friend for so many years, and I love you for that. There was a long pause, and Father Coons looked up. There were large tears running down his face, and all he could say was, I know. I know. Around 10 p.m. that night, the two priests had arrived at St. Michael's Church, the destination for Father Coons. He got out of the car. Father Fiore rolled down the car window and shouted, Hey Al, make sure you get yourself something to eat. I will, Coons yelled back, before heading inside and out of the cold. Most likely within an hour or two of arriving home, Father Coons was startled. A noise woke him from his sleep. Someone was in the building. A stranger stepped out of the cold night and into the church and home of Father Coons. 
But this part of the story is a mystery because we don't know the stranger's name and we cannot see the stranger's face. We can only wonder if Father Coons knew the name or recognized the face. Regardless, Father Coons would have greeted the stranger with warmth and kindness. How may I help you, my child? But the stranger was not seeking the love of God, the warmth of the church. He only wanted one thing from Father Coons. The stranger would greet Coons with anger, maybe an accusatory question, a death threat, or words of hatred. The stranger rushes the old priest and attacks him. Forced to defend himself, Father Coons fights back as he is being hit repeatedly. After a long struggle, the stranger gets up and he pulls from his coat a knife. Father Coons grabs at the blade with his bare hands, trying to pry the knife from his assailant. Sadly, he is unsuccessful. The stranger put the blade to the side of Coons' neck and slits the throat of the beloved father. The stranger, now covered in blood, injured and probably cut, stands up. And as he gathers himself, he curses the priest. Then he steps back out into the cold night. Who was this stranger? Was he a mentally ill drifter? Or some sick, twisted Satanist? Or was he someone the priest had trusted? This is True Crime Garage. And this is the case of Father Alfred Coons. Yeah, definitely a freaky one there. With like the nice children singing at the beginning. And then it gets yeah. dark. Then it gets dark. Real Very quick. dark. Yeah. Real quick. That was a that was a case at first when you sometimes when we put the case is on the schedule, and then you mm-hmm. look back at it. You can't remember, well, why did we put it on the schedule? And initially, it didn't didn't seem like there was much there or that would be that interesting. And then also, sudden, two days into researching a case like that, you just get wrapped up into it. Yeah, that was a weird case and probably one of the lesser known cases that's on our trailer countdown that we're featuring yeah. this week. That's the murder of Father Alfred Kuhn, still unsolved, 1998 case out of Dane, Wisconsin. And I think that would have come to us by way of listener suggestion, because I don't know that that's one that we would have found on our own. I'm with you, Captain. I can't recall where it came from, but it was the same thing. It's like on the surface, you go, is there is there really a story here? Because it seems like kind of a random misunderstood murder to the point where the the police and detectives have been up up front and honest saying we're not even 100 percent sure what the motive here right was and then you start peeling back the layers and there's a lot to the story and in fact i remember it was difficult to write the the trailer piece you know you, you putting together the music and me putting together the words there and it was difficult to come up with something for that story to lead us into that story. And I relied on my, one of my favorite quotes there, captain from Stephen King, who said, when all else fails, give up and go to the library. So I remember writing a good majority of that case in that trailer at the local library. Mm -hmm. That is a fantastic trailer. And actually it's one that is, so good, of course, that it made the top three of our top ten. Because we're so awesome. <laughs> but it's, well, I mean, we're not talking about anybody else's show here today. If we're That'd doing, be weird. If, if we, we did, did a top ten countdown of other people's shows, it would be it would be bizarre. Yeah. But uh, it's old enough in our catalog that it, it's kind of, it was almost forgotten by myself, right? Like, mm-hmm. we're getting to the point now where we've done so many cases and so many shows that I don't want to forget any of the victims. I don't want to forget any of the shows that we've done. And so I worry about that and I fear that. And when we were putting together our list, this was one that I remembered as soon as I saw the title and the title is the devil did it. And it's episode one twenty six. So way back in the day. Yeah. I tend to remember the earlier stuff because it's when we tried things like, Look, when you're reading your transcript, every now and then a little double devil voice comes in. And we tried that for a couple of 
trailers and sometimes it works. Mm-hmm. It really needs its right place. But it's like also like that was one of the first times that there was a separate piece of music before the theme actually started. Um, and so I kind of remembered those more. But even like when people were at, at CrimeCon, they'll go, hey, have you covered this case yet? And so sometimes you go, that sounds familiar. But, you know, we've done 500 episodes. But think about the amount of cases we've looked into just to put on our, our master list of cases to cover eventually. Yeah, that's incredible. When you when you put it that way, my mind starts racing because it's easily I mean, five times the number of cases that we ended up covering. Yeah, 2,500 cases I've probably read about in the last five years. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's a lot of kill, kill, murder, kill. Well, and unfortunately, yes, that's exactly what it is. But it's also got to the point now when we receive our, you know, people email. That's our preferred way to receive a case suggestion is mm-hmm. to email it to us. The The blog is there, and I love the people that that want to get a case out there, and they say, look, I wasn't sure where to put this, so I'm just going to put this here on this week's blog that goes along with this week's case. So God bless you for putting it wherever wherever you can. But if you get the opportunity, we love to receive them via email and would love to have the blog continue. Hopefully the good conversation that you and I put together for that week's case and everybody out there in listener land and in parts unknown can expand on that and put in their own ideas, their thoughts, their theories too. I love when we cover an unsolved case and I get to hear a theory that we didn't present or an idea that's outside of the box because those are the things thinking that way. Those are the things that will ultimately help get these things solved. Definitely. So just a quick recap at number 10, we had son of Sam. Number nine, we had Tupac Shakur. Number eight, we had West Memphis three. Number seven, BTK. Number six, Unabomber. Number five, Killing Fields. Number four, Boys on the Tracks. Number three, The Devil Did It. Let's take a quick beer break and we'll get to the top two trailers of True Crime Garage. You party people, cheers. You party animals. <laughs> why like, why are people party animals? How did, did that happen? Know. Have you ever seen a group of animals together partying down? I saw a, a guy uh, on I think it was a TikTok video or something, but he had a muzzle on a on a hyena. And he, oh. and he had he had a hyena on like a dog leash. Oh, he was trying to control it, walking down the street, and it was like trying to attack people. It's one of the scariest things I've ever God, seen in my life. I do not want to see that. I, I, no. I'm terrified. That's one animal that I'm terrified of. It, and it's not like a, it's not like a metal muzzle or anything. It's like a, <laughs> right. it's like a makeshift muzzle. Like yeah, you can't just put a regular muzzle on that thing. You need no. a souped up muzzle. I mean that that's the one of the creatures I'm terrified of. I think it's partly because they're they're very vicious creatures. Yeah, but you know like But the, in the cartoons they all, they're always like laughing. Remember they like do something bad? Yeah, they And hide, then the hyenas yeah. they sit together and laugh about it afterwards. So not only do you end up being dinner, mm-hmm. but you are also the butt of all their jokes. Uh, afterwards at least somebody's laughing at their jokes right they're like "Ooh, the colonel was extra crispy today <laughs> yeah thank god we got him on one of those extra crispy days yeah, mm, kinda, yum 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 but his his legs were kind of like chicken legs oh he got them chicken legs no but uh <laughs> no but i like uh bulldogs and you know like you got uh, and pit bulls and and they look like tough dogs and that's kind of what it looked like at first but this neck it's probably, I don't know, 
three, four times the size. And of, longer, too. Like, uh, yes. Like, freakishly longer. Like, yeah, it's it's scary. Uh, so, what's the world coming to? People were thinking that we're leading up to our Insanesville show. Oh, yeah, yeah. Our Insanesville trailer. But that's not coming in at number two, no. But, well, no, uh, because we had a lawsuit. We're not allowed to talk about Insanesville anymore. Uh, poor Zanesville. Everybody kept on saying uh, they called it Insanesville. The town of Zanesville sued the garage yeah, they, they for said, an undisclosed amount of money. It wasn't much, but they did win. <laughs> they did win. They did and, win. Uh, but they just want they really wanted us to stop calling it Insanesville. Yeah, we paid them in Bush Light and we called um, it even. There's a couple other names that Zanesville goes by. Um, but I'm not allowed to because of the lawsuit. That's um, right. We're sworn to secrecy. We signed a uh, non disclosure agreement yeah some Um, some crazy people from zanesville but what we can disclose is a big shout out to thomas and quarryville pennsylvania and chelsea and issaquah washington yeah yeah and zane's kill is what other people call it too uh so yeah zane's kill so you got in zanesville and zane's kill and here comes another lawsuit (laughs) Number two. Lawsuit number two. Number two. I'll just sit there with his bottles. <laughs> number two. All right. So should we get to it? Number two. following is a letter written and sent from a Maryland prison. You are always asking me about my murders. Well, here is one that no one knows about. That's right, pal. I have never told anyone about this murder. I never had to go far to find a victim, for most all truck stops across the U.S. had whores working in and around them. This is a story of a young prostitute I killed in October of 1995. She was working the 76 truck stop in Reno, Nevada. I was driving a blue long-nosed Peterbilt. I was hooked up to a freezer trailer. That's a trailer with a freezer. I beat and raped that bitch in the sleeper of that truck that night until I grew tired of her. Then I put my hands on her neck and I began squeezing. Her screams of pain slowly dwindled down to mere rasp of agonizing grunts and groans. The sounds she made slowly faded away, never to be heard again. Sweet death had finally come down upon her. Now her body was just a dead carcass, laying in wait for the decomposition to start, the breaking down of cells. I laid there with my arms wrapped around her dead body and slept for about three hours. I woke up to my alarm clock going off at 5.30 a.m. I climbed over her and I got dressed. I throwed a blanket over her. Then I started the truck up. I got out of the truck, locked the door, and headed over to the coffee shop to grab a bite and check the computer for loads heading east. The closest thing I saw available to me that I was looking for was a load of ranch house salad dressing they wanted taken down to Houston, Texas. The company was located over in Sharps, Nevada, which is only about 25 miles north of the truck stop. I decided to accept the job. I grabbed a coffee to go and off to the truck I went. I climbed up into the cab and checked everything out, and off I go. I got to the warehouse in Sharps that had the load, but there was no one there because it was Saturday morning. 
The sign on the door said they were opened up at 9 a.m., but it was only 7.45 a.m. So I looked around, and there wasn't a damn soul in sight. There wasn't nothing around this little business park. So I thought, this would be a perfect place to ditch her off. I dragged her dead ass out of the truck. I grabbed my little army shovel, and off I went to the back of that little warehouse. I found a nice isolated area back there. I buried her in about 45 minutes. This industrial park wasn't very old, so the ground was pretty soft. And that's where she is to this day. It was not for another two bodies later that I would realize what a waste of all that good meat was, only ending up being nothing more than bug and worm food. I have never shed a tear for those I have killed, nor will I down the road. Those sweet, young, drug-addicted prostitutes that I killed back in my past were pretty much dead to the world long before I killed them. They were nothing more than walking zombies, looking for a few moments of pleasure from their sick, twisted daily lives of shame. I feel I've done those poor souls a favor. If I feel anything for them, I feel only some jealousy, for their pains are over. And mine will continue as I sit behind these bars until the day I die. I have enclosed my tooth for you. We never met, but now you will always have a part of me with you. You take care. Be safe out there, my best friend. Signed with a thumbprint pressed in blood. Probably one of our most downloaded cases of all time. And you know what, Captain? I actually think that it's probably up there in the world of downloads because of your music. Not Mm. necessarily the... Look, it's it's a gross, disgusting, horrific letter that serial killer Joseph Metheny wrote mm-hmm. that the we were 500 reading. 500-pound serial killer. 500-pound serial killer is what we called him, and that's because that's about the... Because he's a fat ass. Well, he, you know, he was a bigger guy when he got arrested for his crimes, but he grew. He continued to grow and expand while in prison, and he seemed to have a good time in prison enjoying writing letters and becoming pen pals with people on the outside. And that was just one of his many, many letters. He was only convicted of two murders, suspected of several more. And he claims he's one of these dudes. He he lies about large portions of his life. Right. And so he claims to have killed several more people than just two, but he was a, a monster that, um, it's one of those chicken or egg situations, right? Where you go, okay, did the drugs that he became addicted to, did they do this to him or was he already evil Mm -hmm. before he started down that path? And of course one will never know, but before he passed away in 2017, he was pretty close, if not over the 500 pound mark. And if you want to see, you think that trailer scary, the words that he says there, if you want to Google a picture of Joseph Metheny, uh, there's some scary pictures that was, you will see there. I was just going to say that. And, you know, he doesn't, he just, it's hard to say that he even looks um, fat. He just he's kind of a big dude. He looks unhuman, right? Yeah. He doesn't even look to be human. But yeah, you're right. This was one of our more downloaded episodes. And I think a lot of it was, I mean, look, that that's some good music there at the beginning yeah but, after. yeah, but people don't know what the music sounds like before they download the episode. I think, right. the, I think but it, I think it's, it's the title. I 500 think that, pound serial killer. How can you pass that up? That's true. You have to be you have to be a psychopathic serial killer to pass up that title. So maybe from now on every title is just the weight of <laughs> 185 pound serial killer. Of the convicted person mm. in in followed by serial killer. Maybe that's what we do. <laughs> We're trying to have a successful show. <laughs> After this conversation, everybody's thinking to themselves, if they can do it, why can't I? Well, you know what? I, I'm i thinking the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> hey, 
hey, I got a great idea. We should start a podcast. And by the way, we've had a lot of bourbon, so I yeah. please, please forgive us. What's it called? It's, it's Angel's Envy. Oh. <laughs> which was one that was recommended to us by Bob Ruff. Yeah. And um, I, I thought it was Anal's Envy, and I, oh I thought that God. didn't, uh, that see, didn't make see, sense. See, this is what happens. That All right. Okay, a couple sure. shout outs before we forget to do them. Beer shout fun. out to yes, B-W-R-U-N, Beer, Beer Run. Run. Jennifer in Raleigh, North Carolina, the captain and Crispy Colonel Love, North Carolina. Mm-hmm. And then we have Buffy in Lake Charles. See, this is what's weird about the, the beer shout outs, right? When somebody is from a city, you say that they are in, right? Mm-hmm. That so-and-so is in. But when the city name is Lake, to say that they're in the lake, yeah. well, that raises some questions, right? So we say Buffy from Lake Charles, Louisiana. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hey, Buffy, you're so fine. You're so fine. You blow my mind. Hey, Buffy. Hopefully on the shores mm-hmm. of Lake Charles. Yeah, get in the tan. It is so freaking hot outside. <laughs> it's humid. You go outside, it's thick. It is thick. It's thick. Humid. All right, so are we to number one? Numero uno. Is that where we find ourselves? That <laughs> I don't know where we find ourselves. Where do you find yourself? Where do you find yourself? And <laughs> If somebody told me uh, five years ago that... We would have hit 500 episodes. I would have said, nah, not going to happen. I would have said maybe 200, 300. Uh, Once we reached the 50 mark, 200 seemed obtainable. Yeah. 500 still seemed very well out of reach. Question for you then. Do you think we can, do you think we'll hit another 500? So one of my favorite numbers and I hate to be one of that weird guy, but I've had enough bourbon that I can one be the weird guy. One of my favorite numbers is three. No, one of my favorite numbers is 999, 999. So I would like to get to that point. Do you stop at that weird number or do you go to 1,000? Stop at that number? No- I might stop halfway through that episode. Oh. So just, <laughs> just get up at like, Sorry. you know. You know that part where we come back from the from the commercial and the yeah. captain goes, "All right, and we're back. Cheers to everybody." It's just you'll, thirty minutes. You'll of hear silence. me go, "Cheers," and walk out the garage. Yeah. And then I have to say, "And they never stopped the crime." <laughs> I don't know where he went, but I know they never solved the crime. All right, here's our number one. This is going to please and anger a lot of people all at the same time. John Benet Ramsey, unknown intruder, her brother. John Benet Ramsey. Oh my God! They still have not interviewed the parents. I didn't do it. John Ramsey didn't do it. He didn't have a clue of anybody to do it. My life has been hell from that day forward, and I want nothing more than to find out who was responsible for this. Gives me the chills every single time. Every time. Hair standing up on the mm. back of my neck. Don't ask me why there's so much hair on the back of my neck. Yeah, and but no, nowhere else, just like <laughs> on the collar around your neck. Right. Uh, yeah, well, but technically that was also a theme. You're right. So... The, we <laughs> we kind of broke our own countdown. We kind of screwed screwed it up because there were some trailers. Not in every. I'm going off a of memory here. Not in every. We did a six parter John Bonet. Yeah, and that was as the captain said, kind of the theme that started off every one of those six episodes. 
And but, we started that with episode number 355 mm-hmm. and did that for almost the entire month of December. Yeah, we always like to try to take off around Christmas. Plus, people get really busy with the holidays, so it's hard for them to keep up. I mean, heck, I mean, we put out so much content that I hear from listeners all the time. It's hard to keep up with you guys. Well, and hearing Patsy Ramsey, regardless of your feelings, if she's guilty or innocent, hearing her, and kudos to you, Captain, for taking those clips and piecing them and putting them so perfectly into the music that you created. But hearing Patsy, Patsy Ramsey in there really evokes a lot of emotion one way or the other. Just hearing yeah. her, you know, speaking or crying out in regards to the the murder of of Jean Benet. Yeah, the thing too is like because that that case to me, and I'm sure you'll you will agree, it, it seems like such a Christmas time case. Yes, you know, not only that's when the murder took place, but just also the pictures that you see leading up and and afterwards and so using um little themes you know from christmas i mean obviously like when you hear sleigh bells makes you think of christmas so to throw throw in sleigh bells to use some themes from like oh holy night um use some choir sounds because that's also something that you hear more around that time uh frame and just uh, then once you start hearing those sound clips, I'm going to say this, and, and, and maybe listeners would agree, Christmas songs become so familiar. Mm-hmm. And so there's this uh, nostalgia every time you hear one, when you hear Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. It doesn't even matter who's singing. It doesn't matter if it's a old version or a new, new version. It's like there's nostalgia there. And now on, around Christmas time, we start playing the same movies over and over. The Christmas Story and National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Um, so you start to see a Home Alone and they start playing those over and over and over. But what's interesting about a case as big as the John Bonet Ramsey case is almost all those clips that you hear in the trailer or theme, however you want to call it, they're nostalgic now because they've been a part of so many documentaries, been part of so many uh, nights researching a case like that where you hear those clips over and over and over. So it really kind of becomes a part of the, your fabric of your past. Well, while we're talking about things that we you know, reminisce on and things that we miss and things that we want to hear more of, a little piece in there too is Dan Rather's voice. Yeah. I miss Dan Rather's voice. I loved, you know, I wasn't a news guy when I was a kid, obviously, or, mm-hmm. or even as a young adult, but well, he, maybe, maybe you were just a little bit and that's how you got that hair around your neck. Right. He was always there and he was always like the poster child of the news for me. Yeah. And his voice is just, I mean, he's got a beautiful voice and you always felt like, you know what, no matter what, you know, I have different things that I could tune into, different stations to go to, but when Dan Rather was delivering a piece of information to you, it just felt like the gospel, right? It just felt like the like this guy could could do no wrong, could tell us no wrong, and I, I do miss me some... I miss the fact that the news used to be news and not a bunch of opinions. That there you go. It used to be like we, we're sharing this information because we want you to be informed and we want all of our citizens to know what's going on and know the truth uh, so they can make informed decisions and become smarter people in society and we could all grow together. And now they want everybody fighting against everybody and they want they don't want anybody to know the truth and, uh, you know, Hey, don't sad times. Don't mention fighting too much with that weird guy that's in the corner that did the the countdown. Yeah, he started numbers. pulling out one of the bottles. Yeah, real he's, slowly. he's getting he's getting oh. a little weird. Oh. Whoa, whoa, oh, put whoa! That, put that 
put that bottle back in. Well, on that note, Ooh. shout out to Brandon in San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> and a shout out to Lauren in Sanger, Texas. Old Sanger, Texas. Sanger, Sanger. Texas. Hey, at least it wasn't Sanger. Pflugerville. Pflugerville, <laughs> Pflugerville, Schnugerville. I still have my Pflugerville belt buckle. You know what, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to announce Schnugerville. it here for the very first time. Wait, what's it, what was the town that you just said? True Crime Sa- Garage Sangerville. Live Event in Pflugerville, November 2024. Yeah, <laughs> November 21st, 2024. There you go. Get your tickets today. It's going to sell out. It will sell out because we have, we have four years. Yeah, to- well, three, but, mm. uh, you know, again, we already said math's not our thing. So what was it, Sangerville? Sanger. Yeah. You're like, well, here's what happened. They said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a Sanger. <laughs> Mama, I want to be a Sanger. And they go, oh, Sangerville. Sangerville, Texas. Well, it's not Sangerville. It's Sanger. It's no, it's Sanger. not Sanger. You well, added the Ville, well, which is, it's which is great. That's what we do on the show. We create fake cities and yeah. towns. Yeah, that's right. Sangerville. All right, this has gone to a weird place. Uh, yeah, <laughs> as we thought that it might would that we thought that it might. Mm. Ugh. Ugh. Yeah, we're not editing this. We're it'll be you can't edit with one eye open. That's right. We want to thank everybody who has allowed us to continue to sit in this garage. We want to thank you and spank you. We want to thank you and spank you for allowing us to put air conditioning in this garage, <laughs> so we we didn't keel over. You know, years ago. And when we meet people that tell us, hey, I've been there since the beginning. I've been listening to you guys since 2015 or 2016. When we meet people that say, you know what? I just found the garage and I went back and I binged all those old episodes. I said, liar. That would have taken (laughs) way too long. I started a week ago and I finished today. What? Impossible. To put a piano up We just want to hug you all and thank you all for... For being awesome to us, and hey, look, if they're gonna follow you through 500 episodes, they'll follow you everywhere. Hey, round up the kids. We're going to Sangerville, well, <laughs> and Flugerville, and Snoogerville. God bless you, that's Flugerville. Our, that way, that's the way we're going on the tour from Sangerville to Flugerville. Well, it's Sanger. To... God bless you, Sanger. No, we changed it. That's remember? right. Yeah, it's our tour. Parts Unknown to Sangerville, to Pflugerville, to Schnugerville, and then back to Parts Unknown. I apologize, Captain. The extra crispy kernel has gone <laughs> extra soggy kernel. <laughs> <laughs> God, your, your little chicken wings are yeah, oh, soaking up all the I alcohol. can't fly. I can't fly. I just want to fly. Yeah, well, now they have Angel Envy. All right, well... <laughs> If 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 you uh, make it to, to episode five hundred one, uh, we'll we'll try to be back. Um, we we no we make no promises, and we like ma- we said, all downhill from here. So if you'd like to go rate us five star review on iTunes, that would we'd pre- we'd appreciate it. And until next week, if we make it, if we make it. Stay tuned to figure out if we made it. A wise man once told me Mm. to be good and be kind and don't litter.